in my thank you, I, I'll use uh, General Lou McKenzie's uh, answer to a, a very kind toast, or a very kind welcome. My father would have been proud and my mother would have believed it. Thank you. <laughs> War is hell, but it's not as hellish as you think it is. Especially when you know that you're the right age at the right time to carry on your father, father's drill that he did in World War I. And my father had a pretty tough time in World War I. He was a, an engineer by profession and a machine gunner by killing. And the machine gunners in World War I were the actual commandos and paratroopers in World War II, the equivalent. Everybody looked at the machine gun because the machine gun was the killer. War is not a mystery, it's a challenge. Can you do it? And from the time we started in 1940, realizing we were going to have to land again in Europe, was how do we do it and how fast can we do it? It took four years of training and four years of all of our offices, factories, production lines to produce the quantity of equipment which we needed to land into Europe. And on our shoulders fell the responsibility and we were told in no uncertain terms that in a major battle like this, your life expectancy as a lieutenant platoon commander is seven days. I was 20 years old. And I said, that old sucker doesn't know what he's talking about. <laughs> And the only person that would have really enjoyed it and loved it if she'd heard it was my dear old Scottish granny in Bristol, England, because grandfather was sorting out the English. <laughs> and that's what we had to do. It wasn't a matter of how we were going to do it, we were going to do it. But we did a lot of funny things. And I told the my British helper beside me for dinner, I was telling him a story, he's a, another good Celt. We have three, all three Celts are represented here. My caregiver is a, is a taffy. My good council general here is a patty, and I'm a jock. <laughs> So all the Celts are here. <laughs> but our biggest worry was, how can we get it all together and how can we do it? And when in doubt, go back to square one. And believe it or not, World War, the landing in Normandy, was a very, very complex and very worrisome thing. There are very high tides, and to make everything worse, when all your maps are usually north and south to the way you're going, with that hook where we were landing, the beach wasn't north and south, it was east and west. And let me tell you, that made us shake our heads a couple of times. And as one guy said, if you think we got trouble, think of the Air Force flying up there. They're having three times more trouble. <laughs> I belong to a group of Canadians called Can Loan. There were 623 of us volunteers. Actually, there was about 800. 
but they cut it down to 623 officers to volunteer to help the British Army out in 1943. The Brits had been very heavily committed in the Mediterranean, the Far East, and they had very heavy casualties in the platoon commander bracket. And Canada had just closed down three home defense divisions where the soldiers were conscripts to serve only in Canada, but the officers, warrant officers, and non-commissioned officers had all volunteered for overseas service. So they could go anywhere, and they were what we called the regulars, and in true, very honest, British-style, young Canadian officers, the people that waited until they had to be drafted and didn't volunteer, we called them zombies. <laughs> One thing about soldiers, they're very honest. They'll tell you exactly when you do something wrong and when you do something right, and I can see a lot of heads shaking up and down in this room right now, because we've all lived it. He's the most wonderful guy in the world. Whether that soldier, and I'll use the word soldier for all three services, works on sea, land, or air. But it's not by chance. When you took, take a look at this room right now, you could bring in four or five newspaper people and say, what would happen in this case? What would happen in that case? And I'll guarantee you there's at least one person that every one of those questions can stand up and say, I'm so-and-so from such-and-such such a place, and this is the way you do it. That's what made the West. That's what made the East. That's what made the left coast. You name it, we've got it. But you can always find in a thousand people the answer to any question the government or, the, or our, our country has. And as our armed forces are exactly the same way. The Patricias spend a lot of time every winter in the Arctic. And this is a very quick one. We had trouble right after the end of World War II up in the Yukon Territories because all the garages up there, oil was so expensive to get up there, they didn't heat them. With the result that every car, was, every vehicle was frozen the next morning. So they did all the old normal stuff they did on the farms. Take the battery out, put it beside the stove. The stove was on all night. Take some hot oil and put it in the cold oil. We still had to get them pushed. And then there was one guy by the name of Kajerski walked up, and he was our friendly Polak in the transport. And nicknames, please don't, I'm not being prejudiced. In my regiment, nicknames are honorable. You get a nickname because you're good, not because you're bad. And Kajerski came up and he said, up in northern Saskatchewan we had that trouble, but there wasn't any problem. And the transport officer says, what do you mean, jerk? That was his nickname. He said, "Is all we did is when winter was coming along, grandfather would go in to grandmother and say, give me one of those empty cans of tomato juice. And she'd give him the empty can, and he'd say, I'll go out and use some Varsol and throw it into the engine. He said, you what? He said, the tractor runs mad as soon as I do that. The oil is nice and smooth. Goes like bull. Do you know what? That was called Winter 40. Put out by Imperial Oil. And Kajerski, after I got in there and bugged him, got $20,000. That was big money for, for a Polish guy from Winnipeg. 
<laughs> and he looked at me, he said, what do I do with it? I said, you put it in the flippin' bank and don't put your hands on it because one of these crazy days you want to get married and you'll need the money. <laughs> but how does all this work in with D-Day? That is what the armies had. We had the gem of our country in the young men on those beaches doing it. D-Day was supposed to be the 5th of June. But the weather was so bad on the 5th of June that they said we've got to give it to a one day at least warning. And the weather people came in and said it's going to last two days. They said maybe it'll blow out, we'll do it day at a time. And then Eisenhower was told in no uncertain terms that if he called that off, by the time they canceled it, took all of us back to England again, all those boats and all the equipment, most of it, would be obsolescent because people had seen it, people had used it. The Germans knew what we had and we'd have to come up with all new equipment and we could not relaunch the landings in Europe for another four years. Talk about being pinned in a corner. We were. Eisenhower said, we go on the 6th. So I was very worried about it. When I had my breakfast, I was walking past a galleyway that was opened into the kitchen in this mothership. And there was about 3,000, I will swear to God, 3,000 bully beef sandwiches. At 21 years old, you're a mobile tapeworm. So I just grabbed one, stuck it in my pocket, and got all set with my men. And we were the first wave off the mothership. And that's the best way to be, because the first guys off, all the landing craft are still using the divots where the lifeboats were. So you walk from the deck into the lifeboat, it swung out, dropped down, bouncing around like a teapot, and away you go and you start circling your mothership, and then when you're at the time and it's the right time to move and the right wave goes in, the Navy blow all the whistles and blow off funny colored balls of fire and everything else, and away we went. And I'll say one thing for the Navy, they can sure get you there. <laughs> but let me tell you, as soon as one round lands on that flipping beach, they're all gone. <laughs> God bless the Navy. <laughs> they wouldn't be fair if I didn't take a shot at the Navy. <laughs> and when you're, a, when you're a humble Patricia, yeah. and I want all the Navy officers to, lo to watch, listen to this, you know, we're just an ordinary infantry unit. And we're named Princess Patricia. And Princess Patricia, when she was getting very old, and we knew we were going to lose her, and we figured, what are they going to come up with in the way of a female to be our Colonel-in-Chief? She solved it for us. God blessed it. She willed her regiment to her niece, the Lady Patricia Brayborn. Brayborn was Lord Brayborn, a captain in the Grenadier Guards. Who ever heard of him? He's not important. He just walks around and looks pretty. <laughs> the one was his wife. And she was Patricia Mountbatten. <laughs> and she was a wren. We were the only Canadian army that could get back at the Navy. Because we'd look at them and say, well, you know, we're just a humble bunch of guys, but when our Colonel-in-Chief comes, she brings her father along as her ADC, and he's the, and he's the Admiral-in-Chief of the British Navy. And he's a nice guy, you know, and we call him by his first name. <laughs> you never saw so many Navy guys watching the Tupic of the Color, because we used to put special deals for them, and they all came in and we fed them, but we had a great time. <laughs> An offshoot of D-Day, 
D-Day was an offshoot day. It wasn't supposed to be then. But we had to win. And we flippin' did it. Every one of your parents did it. The women drove streetcars, they drove buses, they did every job in the factory with their tag suits on and everything else. And they made the guns that we actually fired and the ammunition that went into them. And now we have a new, new battlefield. Every time we lose in hockey, we send in the girls and they win. <laughs> a big cheer for the girls. That's Canada. That's D-Day. It happens every day in this country. How do you maintain it? How do you keep it going? Oh, there's people that can bring out books. They can tell you all kinds of things that you can do. But I'm going to keep it simple to one factor. And world peace is not difficult. If you teach every person, male or female, when you get up in the morning, you do one thing. You look in the mirror and you realize that what you see in the mirror is the only person in the world you can't snow. And the second thing is the sentence that goes with it. Do unto others as you'd have them do unto you. It's called the golden rule. We don't need all this high tech. Think about it. One of the principles of war is keeping it simple. And there's a new expression running around, it's called the kiss factor. Keep it simple, stupid. I hope I've given you something to think about, and I want you to realize that my generation that fought World War II were very square. Thank you. <laughs>
75 years ago was there people from right across the country, from east to west, took off their, their shoes and put on the military boots. And with those military boots, it's so important for us to realize that what they did was preserve our democracy and freedom. And for that, that's why we're here. I'm heading shortly to, um, I'm heading shortly to a special ceremony at the Union Station to give these boots an unofficial send-off to Halifax. And in fact, we started this ceremony in Vancouver. And it, was, it is so touching to do these things and to remember the sacrifice that was involved. The journey echoes those taken by the men and women who volunteered to join the war effort during the Second World War. Many traveled by train to Halifax to board ships in order to go over to liberate Europe. During the course of the war, more than a million Canadians and Newfoundlanders from all parts of the country and every walk of life traded in their civilian shoes for these combat boots. They came to de in the defense of our allies and liberated a continent from tyranny. As time passes, it is critical that we not forget the sacrifice made by, by those who had advanced across the beaches of Normandy under vicious gunfire 75 years ago. As part of an ongoing effort to keep their memory alive, a journey across Canada began in Vancouver in March, stopping in communities along the way, giving Canadians the opportunity to remember the 75th anniversary of D-Day and the Battle of Normandy. A delegation that concludes a number of veterans will attend the ceremonies in Halifax where wreaths will be laid in honor of Canadians who served in this pivotal campaign. I will accompany an official delegation which includes D-Day veterans to commemorate in the commemorations in Normandy. We will lay wreaths at the Canadian War Cemeteries and Memorial Gardens there. On June the 6th, the 75th anniversary of D-Day, we will participate in a ceremony of remembrance at the Juno Beach Center in Normandy. We will honor the sacrifice and achievements of Canadians who took part in Operation Overlord that day, particularly the more than 700 Canadians who were wounded and the 359 who made the ultimate sacrifice. Canadians played an essential role in the Allied success on D-Day and in ensuring the Battle of Normandy, victory came at a terrible cost. More than 13,000 Canadian soldiers were wounded, and over 5,000 were killed. Among the more than 200,000 Allied casualties during the campaign. That victory was not the end of the war, far from it. But the impact made Canadians in that initial invasion, Canadians. Uh, the impact made by Canadians by that initial invasion will outlast the men and women who crossed the beaches that day. I want to thank the Royal Canadian Military Institute and the Juno Beach Centre Association for bringing us here today to help ensure that future generations appreciate the sacrifice of those who serve. Your work is essential in passing the legacy of Canadian, the Canada's role in the Second World War. And that is so important that the legacy is so remembered. Thank you for taking the time to recognize and remember the more than 90,000 Canadian soldiers who took part in the Battle of Normandy and over the one million Canadians who served in the Second World War, as well as our brave men and women who continue to serve our nation. Canada remembers and honors their colleagues and their sacrifice. Thank you so much. An honor to be here. This has been another in our series of webcasts produced by the Royal Canadian Military Institute in Toronto as a public educational service. You can find news of upcoming events and links to our webcast archives at www.rcmi.org. On behalf of the RCMI, this is Eric Morse saying goodbye for now and thank you for joining us.